All means all. Cultivating Inclusive STEM Learning. Presented by Dr. Chi Ying Lim and Dr. Megan Vin. Hello, my name is Megan Vin, and I use she, her, hers pronouns. I'm the co-director for the STEMI Center, and I'm delighted to be your host again today. I'm so happy you could all be here for the final day of our virtual STEMI Fest. It's been such an amazing experience to have so many talented, dedicated people sharing their knowledge about inclusive STEM. And it's been wonderful to have so many people engaged in the discussion. I am learning so much from all of you, and I hope that we can continue this work together even after STEMI Fest ends. We've got another full day, so let's get started with our second keynote address of the week, All Means All, Cultivating Inclusive STEM. Dr. Lim and I are excited to present you with practical strategies for engaging all young children, especially those with disabilities in STEM experiences. It's followed directly with a Q&A, and we hope to hear from you. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Um, my name is Megan Vin, um, and I'm the co-director of um, the STEMI Center, and I'm so excited to be here today. Um, and I'm going to... Um, and I'm going to let you know before I let Ching introduce yourself and before I give a little bit of an opening about myself as well. There is a poll. If you go over, um, there is a button on your right. Um, and if you go over and click on, scroll down to where it says polls, you'll find a poll on who's in the room. We want to know who you are. Um, and yeah, so please go ahead and do that. I wanted to give you, I know I look a little different than that pre-recorded introduction. I didn't do a costume change, but um, I just want to say that I am a um, white female. I have blonde hair and I'm wearing my pink headphones. I have um, a button-down shirt on and I am uh, wearing a black um, cardigan. I had a moment where I couldn't think of that. I'm in my living room. I will tell you, I hope that you don't see my French bulldog um, behind me who is snoring away. Um, but if he pops in, um, we'll see that. So Ching, why don't I turn it over to you and um, you go ahead and share a little bit about yourself. Yep, sure. Hey, I'm Ching Lim and um, I used to pronounce she, her, hers. And I'm an Asian with lightly tan skin short black hair and today i'm wearing a short sleeve well no sleeveless blue striped dress and i'm sitting at my desk in my bedroom thanks ching um and i see thank you all for doing the um uh, poll i see that we have a good number about 33 percent of you are practitioners um another 33 percent of you are students we're so glad that we could have you here um and then I think it's interesting we have higher ed faculty and other. Um, and so if you put in the chat what you are um, or what your role is, I should say, thanks, Monica, you're an educational consultant. Um, we hope to sort of tailor this throughout as well. Um, I also wanted to share, um, it might be a little different than some of the other sessions. We hope to hear from you throughout. Um, so feel free to use that Q&A box. Ching and I will be checking that with Julie as well. Um, and so why don't we go ahead and get started? Um, and we really hope to engage with you throughout. All right. Yep. All right, so Ching. Okay, so I'm going to um, just go ahead and um, give some directions for our word cloud that we're gonna to generate together today. And we'll like to be reflecting on this final day of STEMI Fest. What have you gained from engaging in STEMI Fest related to the value of inclusion? We are going to be using Poll Everywhere to generate a word cloud. So you can see a QR code on the screen. So you can scan that with your phone camera. Or you can click on the link um, that I think Christine Herodine has just um, dropped into the chat. So remember to use one single word, or if you're using a phrase, please hyphenate. Um, and we are going to share this back at the end of the session. So it's going to be the big review at the end of the session. So you can continue to add to this cloud as you reflect on the week during the session. So, um, well, so what we're going to move on to next is just as school kids, uh, school age kids have end of grade, 
assessments. I know some of you are going to run away here. Megan uh, would like to give you an end of conference test here. <laughs> so John or Adam, if you can block the, the exit so that no one can escape from this session right now because they heard that we're going to take a test. Megan. <laughs> Thanks, Jing. Yeah, and I hope it's not as scary as it sounds, but we want you to get out um, either maybe a piece of paper or if you're like me, I write on my iPad or just think about it. Um, but we want you to really think about your practice. I know we have a, a pretty diverse group of, we have administrators and practitioners and faculty, but I want you to think um, if you're a practitioner about your own practice. And I also want you to think if you're, whatever your role is, um, how you think this might play out um, as we're thinking about working with children and families. So I hope that you're all ready. So we're going to get started. Um, and I want you to think about, as we do these questions, how often you do these things. And so I'm going to say seldom or never, um, some of the time, as often as I can, or most of the time. And I want you to just think about it. We're not going to ask you to share so you don't have to uh, put this anywhere, but I want you to think about it. So the first question is how often do you recognize the strengths, needs, interests, and abilities of children with disabilities? Just think about it. Is it seldom, some of the time, as often as I can, or most of the time? Great. And then next, I want you to think about how often do you follow the lead of children with disabilities uh, while they are engaged in everyday activities? All right, now question three, there's sort of two parts, but how often do you provide necessary supports, accommodations, or adaptations to maintain child engagement in activities? You might also think about this as um, how often do you make targeted modifications to the environment materials and instruction based on an individual's child's goals and outcomes, right? And I want you to really think critically um, that when I'm asking about necessary supports, accommodations, or adaptations, that is to engage with typically developing peers in these experiences, right? All right, I think I have two more. How often do you respond positively to a child's attempts to repeat or practice the same behaviors or to try something new and different during STEM experiences? And then how often do you encourage child behavior elaborations by modeling new ways of doing things during the child's everyday activities? or maybe by asking open-ended questions or prompting, um, or prompting a child. All right. So now I wanna know a little bit about how you did. So I'm gonna open another poll and you can again find that to the right of your screen. And I want you to think about how did you do or how do you feel you did, right? It's not how other, you know, do you feel pretty good about that? I feel okay. I feel kind of meh, or what just happened? <laughs> so I want you to think about it. Um, and I want you to think about if there are any reflections that you feel comfortable sharing in the chat as well. Um, and so when the poll, I'm gonna look to see how you did in the poll and then see anything that you wanna post in the chat as well. Um, and we're gonna, okay, great. I see some folks who feel great, some that feel okay. Okay, great. Um, I think that's a pretty good mix. Um, and were there any other reflections that you might want to share in the chat? Oh, great. I'm glad we have a lot of people feeling pretty great. Um, and I think it's important that today we're going to really go through and sort of dig into some of these practices a little bit. And I'll keep checking the chat. But I think it's important. One of the things we're going to focus really on today is there are, um, there's a set of resources, we're going to put these in the chat as well, um, related to sort of what are the indicators of high quality inclusion? Um, what does this look like? And those first test questions were taken right out of 
um, the early care and education environment indicators, specifically around instruction. Um, and I really wanted, um, Ching and I really felt it was important to share the whole set, even if we're really focused on the practice piece, because we wanted to make sure that it was clear that inclusion doesn't happen in a vacuum. It's not just on the shoulders of you as practitioners or administrators. We really need to think about what does the state need to do? Uh, what does the community need to do? And what does the local program need to do to support practitioners in implementing those practices that we just talked about a little bit, right? So there's an infrastructure need as well. Um, and if you want to dig a little deeper, you can always go to these indicators. We'll put that in the chat for you. Um, and these really showcase the essential elements that need to happen at every level of the system to support the early care and education environment indicators, um, which are sort of those practice level happens for children and families. Um, we called it early care and education environments because we had many folks that were part of the national partners that said, we don't call ourselves the classroom and I don't call myself a teacher. So we needed to be really thinking about as we're thinking about birth to five, the many environments that children are in. All right. And Ching and I also wanted to really start with this piece from the, um, from the NAUIC Advancing Equity Position Statements. We really think that this is the crux of what we're going to be talking about today, is that all children have the right to equitable learning opportunities. And we need to figure out how we make that possible for all children. And so we're really going to be focused on some practices, and we hope to hear from you. Um, and I really appreciate, um, thanks Patricia for putting in the chat, some other reflections that you had from that first test um, related to really thinking about, you know, how you can put this into your daily practice. So we're hoping that this is helpful and that we'll just give you a taste of what's to come. Mm -hmm. But Ching, I want to turn it over to you to maybe um, get some, some of your thoughts on these pieces related to equitable learning opportunities. Yeah, thanks Megan. And equity and inclusion are mission critical so how can we say that we are engaging in effective STEM teaching if we are only engaging some learners? So what message are we sending to children and families when we deny their um, access before they have the opportunity to show us their strengths, interests, and what they are able to do? Yeah, thanks, Ching. I couldn't agree more with what you're saying. Um, and I think this is really kind of important in this graphic is as we're thinking about what we really mean. Um, and so I think we hear a lot of words, right? Diversity, mm -hmm. inclusion, equity. And I think it's important that diversity um, is critical, but it really is just about sort of the presence of different groups or different perspectives in the room. And we, when we are talking about inclusion and equity, we mean more than that, right? We want people in the room but we want them engaged. We want them to feel like they have power. We want them to feel like they are being affirmed and connecting um, within those environments. And so it's really important that we think about inclusion as when we're evaluating those diverse people present. And then also getting to equity, right? Where the outcome, where all people can achieve a valued goal or circumstance. And so Ching and I are going to be talking a little bit more about this as well. Um, as well. So let's, um, let's just see it and what does it mean for us to try to be cultivating inclusive STEM? So Megan, could you play the video? From please? infancy, all children are ready to explore and engage in STEM learning. And research has shown it is critical for later success in school and life. But young children with disabilities are often denied the opportunity to engage in STEM learning. 40 years of research in early childhood inclusion has proven that when young children with disabilities are included in learning opportunities alongside their peers, they develop positive social relationships and reach improved overall outcomes. Attitudes and beliefs are often the biggest barrier to including young children with disabilities, and STEM is sometimes viewed as too difficult for them. We need to recognize that STEM is for all children and to hold all children to high expectations. Placing children's thinking and learning at the center of what we do 
helps to ensure developmentally appropriate learning opportunities adapted to meet individual needs and aimed at supporting progress towards goals. Learning trajectories are a unique way to know how much a child understands STEM concepts. Families and practitioners are guided and provided examples of strategic language experiences they can embed into routines and activities to support the child's progress in STEM learning. Each learning trajectory is based on a core goal. For example, a goal may be that a child is able to recognize and extend patterns. To help achieve this goal, a recommendation may involve pointing out a repeating pattern of stripes on the child's shirt and saying the colors out loud with them and asking what would happen if the pattern kept going. At STEMI, we have embedded an evidence-based, practice-informed, inclusive framework within the learning trajectories. It focuses on what adults need to do to the environment, materials, or instruction to better engage each and every child. Let's look at how this comes together in real life. Meet Elena. She is a four-year-old girl with a hearing impairment. She is very social with her friends and interested in baking and cooking, but sometimes has trouble with directions. Her favorite food in the world is ice cream sundaes. One goal she is working on is following and giving multi-step directions. Watch how her mother builds on Elena's interest in ice cream and scaffolds her learning to develop a step-by-step -step sequence or algorithm for making an ice cream sundae. First chocolate, then and then this, and then this sprinkles, and then a little bit more, more sprinkles, and then this. STEM is for all children, and it's critical that we hold all children to high expectations. By intentionally making adaptations to the environment, materials, and instruction, adults can ensure children with disabilities can fully participate in STEM experiences in everyday routines and activities. Thanks. All right. All right, now I have to get it to move forward, everyone. <laughs> um, let me... Yeah, so I think we really want to hear from you, you know, what, from what are some, oops, what are some right. takeaways from that video? And if you could share um, your thoughts in the chat. Yeah. Well, and while you're doing that, I think Ching and I are going to share some of our takeaways. Um, and we really do want to hear from you. Um, like what you know, what did you see that we talked about? Um, and we also want to, Ching and I wanted to give you a couple of, you know, facts about uh, inclusion. Mm -hmm. And so I'll start and then um, Ching, I hope you're thinking about your facts about inclusion as well. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the things that we know, and I know we said this um, in the video, is that high quality inclusive settings are the only environments with data that consistently support children's superior learning. Um, and non-inclusive environments have been shown to negatively impact children's learning. So we think that's really important. There's re lots of research to share this. Um, the other piece is that we know that fully inclusive options beat the alternative at a ratio of about 15 studies to one. And I will say in those one studies, they really weren't um, providing the appropriate support and services to be really inclusive. Mm -hmm. um, and thanks, Raquel. I see that in the chat you also said something that you talked about as STEM is for everyone. And we're going to talk a little bit about how you can ensure you're including everyone. Um, mm -hmm. And Ching, what were some of the things that you saw as key yeah, takeaways? I, I think, you know, like the message is really consistent with what we've heard um, all of this week at STEMI Fest. That, um, like what Raquel had said, STEM is for everyone, I think right down to from infancy and that adults and children's lives can really be, be very, very intentional in supporting children's learning. And uh, we see how the mom in the video is uh, really trying to incorporate some of those learning or IEP goals into, um, um, into this activity as well, yeah. And I think, you know, one of the things that I also wanted to add is that, you know, kids with disab uh, without disabilities, um, they also fare much better within inclusive settings. 
And I think oftentimes when people think about inclusion, they think that it's a zero-sum game that if we serve kids with disabilities, then the other children are not, not going to get a uh, lose out. But I think, you know, everyone loses when inclusion does not happen. Thanks, Ching. Mm -hmm. um, and I did see in the chat, we will put the presentation slides up so you have them as well. Um, and I also think, you know, you might be asking yourself um, some questions. So what does it look like, right? We, you know, I, I know you're you're here, right? You know, the research on inclusion and the support for, uh, for it. Um, but what do high quality inclusive programs do is maybe one of the questions. Um, and our uh, friend at the National Center for Pyramid Model Innovations, uh, Dr. Phil Strain, has done a lot of work around this. And so um, we've pulled some of that because we think it's really important to share what do they do. Um, and I know we focus on STEM, but I think what's really important to know is that good inclusion is good inclusion, right? It, and STEM is sort of a vehicle for that. How do we um, ensure that we're using these practices to include children and in all experiences they might have throughout the day, wherever they are, right? Either in, in classrooms, at home, in the community. So it's really critical. Um, but there has been research to so what do they look like? And we're gonna give, dig down and say what some of those strategies are. One thing we know from the research is that um, inclusive, um, high quality inclusive environments. Um, and I have to admit, I pause there because sometimes I struggle with high quality. Um, I really hope we get to the point where we are all inclusive and all doing it well, um, and that there isn't an inequity between um, programs as well. But one of the things we know is that there are more typically developing peers than children with disabilities. There's um, sort of a ratio that happens in natural proportions, uh, like a two to one or three to one ratio. Um, we also know that inclusion is every day, all day long. It doesn't just happen during certain experiences or activities or um, play. It happens all day. It's, it's a part of what we do. We also know that um, these programs do transdisciplinary service delivery where um, adults work together to really support a child. And that might mean that they coach each other. Um, and that they're really coaching the person who's with the child most often. Um, and that's really critical, right? That we're working together. We also know that we use peers. We saw that in some of our videos, right? Earlier on this week, um, that peers can be really powerful and that peers integrating into some of those play experiences that are STEM related are really, um, that's really important, right? To have to really have them also be supporting and teaching. We know that there's predictable and comprehensible routines, right? So sometimes I have, um, so our colleagues talk about routines to the third power. So you have routines within routines within routines. So for example, perhaps I'm in a two-year-old classroom. Let's say it's in a classroom and I'm, I have circle time or something. Um, it's within my daily schedule that it's posted. Then within that, I have a routine. And then within that, I have a routine. So it's really thinking about having these comprehensible, predictable routines um, that support all children. Um, we also know there's not a one-size-fits-all thing that works. So we're using a wide range of evidence-based practices. Um, and we're also using and collecting data. Um, and then I can't stress this enough because Ching and I were talking about this before we started the presentation. And I know, Ching, you may want to chime in too, mm -hmm. is that we have to think about how we support practitioners um, in doing this well. Um, we can't say inclusion's not working um, and really not be preparing and supporting and providing the right um, infrastructure so that that can happen. And coaching is an important one. Mm -hmm. And then also a function-based approach to challenging behavior is really important. Mm -hmm. um, and Kim, I do see your question in the chat. I'm wondering if you could add a little bit more about what you mean. Um, I will say for that ratio, um, one of the things that I think came out of that was what they found was there's, um, it is having, um, well, one, it's what happens sort of naturally, um, but having more typically developing peers allows the teacher to have more time to individualize and collaborate. Um, it also supports, um, peers, um, you know, peer, uh, those peers who maybe are um, 
uh, supporting another child. So there is um, some of that is really why they the research has shown that that's to be more effective. Um, but if there's something I'm missing, uh, let me know and we'll be happy to answer that question. And thanks for posting throughout as well. Mm -hmm. um, and something else that Ching and I wanted to share too, um, or that I, um, I know we wanted to share, is really connecting to what happened earlier in the week, right? Doug and Julie talked about really thinking about where, you know, child's thinking. And yesterday we heard from Christine Cunningham, who gave some great information about engineering, right? And thinking about um, failure. And so one of the things we wanted to also talk about was holding kids to high expectations. Um, doesn't mean that we create opportunities where they're always successful, right? Where sometimes we think maybe we create a, an activity that is uh, too easy so kids can sort of win. We want to make sure that we're encouraging kids to really work together, dig in, and maybe failure is a part of that. And so I really wanted to make sure we said that, that holding high, kids high expectations is critical. We think, um, I don't know if I was going to say, I think this is easy, right? But it's not, right? We know it's not easy. So one of the things so that we've really focused on, um, and it said this in the video, and what we want you to think about is, how do you change your practice? Not how do we change a child? How do we think about how we get that child to better, um, you know, do whatever that experience is? But what do we need to change to make sure that every, as the adults, to make sure that every child can engage? And so that's really thinking about what's happening in our environment, activities, and routines. Um, and so maybe we start there. Can kids, you know, maybe we have some experience can all kids reach the experience? Do I need to put it in a certain location? Um, is there a length of time? You know, maybe I'm, maybe it's going on for too long. How do I really think about that? Also, do I have to modify toys or materials? So like yesterday, Christine talked about loose parts. Do I have to put something on that loose part so a child could grip it more effectively? Um, but really, it's up to us to think about what those things are. And then do I have to change my instruction? Um, and some of those first test questions that we gave you really support that thinking about your instruction. And so we want you to think about what are those pieces and always be continually reflecting on our practice um, and making those modifications and adjustments for all, all learners. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I wanted to add, Megan, that we also have a guide to adaptations that is on our website. Um, and it should be part of the um, handout as well. There's a link directly to the guide to adaptations too. Thanks, Ching. Oh. And actually, I think this leads right into this piece um, that I know you really wanted to talk about um, since we've had so much of this throughout the past week about how STEM happens all around us and we have to figure out how to make sure we're engaging um, learners. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, you can feel free to type into the chat box some of the um, routines and activities that are potential STEM learning opportunities. And um, then we are going to be looking at two video examples of how STEM can be embedded within the home and the classroom. And as you watch each of the videos, just think about like, how is this activity STEM a STEM learning opportunity and what do you see the child doing? What strategies do you see the adult using? So I think, Megan, we can go to the first video. Yes. Good. Kind of bumpy. So it's 
some waffles and then you can have some more brains. Waffles first and then brown. Okay, you had some waffle, and now we're gonna next have some prunes. Can you hold the spoon? Okay, like I think many presenters, such as uh, Pip. Campbell talked about this week, I think, you know, adaptations can really support a child's access and participation and also promote independence. Um, and um, I also saw the mom using some of that STEM talk and using STEM-rich vocabulary, like talking about, you know, just the uh, um, texture as well as the is it warm, cold, you know, the temperature? Um, Megan, um, what do you see in there? Now, I see one of the things that I really appreciate, and I know um, Ching, we're doing with these both videos, is showcasing how inclusion, again, happens every day, all day, right? Um, mm -hmm. This this is home, and we know that many of you work, maybe you're a home visitor, or maybe you're an early interventionist, you go into homes, or perhaps you're um, working in a classroom or practice. So I really appreciated that. Um, and I know we saw this in the video, but I do think it's really important to think about all of the materials, it's sort of, are just within reach, right? All of the things that he's going to, you know, that we're going to be using, the fork, mm -hmm. the food, all of that is within reach. Um, and so um, I think, and I think you can see um, that there's some, you know, like the wider handle um, in the, is that a spoon, Ching? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a kind of spoon with a, a wider kind of a grasp so that, you know, um, the child could just hold. I mean, it's really all about promoting independence so that the child could be exploring, could be, um, you know, just feeding himself and trying things out. Um, yeah. And I think the other thing too, Ching, that we, I think, heard all week as well is that STEM is happening everywhere, mm -hmm. but we have to be intentional about it. So like you said, the mom was using a lot of STEM talk or really thinking about, you know, um, doing some of this, but it was happening during a naturally, you know, mealtime is... A daily activity. So I really appreciate, um, actually, it's more than a daily activity. It happens multiple times a day, um, right here. hopefully. But I really appreciate, um, you know, that piece of it as well, that we're, that it's sort of how do we go from just being a little bit, adding a little bit of intentionality. Mm -hmm. All right. Let me go to the next one, Ching. Yep. I think that sounds good. And we do have a center-based program example in the next one. There we go. This video clip shows an occupational therapist working with a boy with autism in a preschool classroom. The therapist has created a template to assist the child in building a garage with blocks. And since we're already using uh, visual supports to give him some options for activities, I thought maybe also offering him some visual supports for the actual building process would be helpful. I think you're exactly right. All right, can you put him on here. Right on top of there. Uh, there you go. At one of the team meetings, we actually talked through my idea of just making him some little maps that would um, facilitate his building. And so the teacher and I had talked about this and, and agreed that maybe this was a good idea to try. So I went ahead and made the maps of things that he already had choices for on his um, visual supports for actually choosing something to build. And I was trying to be congruent with that. And um, so then the next thing I wanted to do was actually go ahead and take that into the classroom and try it with him uh, and let the teacher observe a little bit, um, if she could, 
just so that we could then evaluate whether this was an intervention that was really going to be helpful to him or not, um, and if we needed to adapt it. Yeah. All right. Now. Lots going on in there. Yeah. But I think, you know, like one of the things that I see is um, that is clear. I mean, the OT is in there um, collaborating with the teacher and they planned um, this activity based on um, what they've observed um, of the child's interest and, you know, where they think, um, how they, they think that they can engage him in um, block playing and building. Yeah, and Ching, I, and I hope others will add in the chat some of the things they saw. But one of the things I really liked um, or also saw <laughs> is, um, you know, other children were also involved in, in this intervention as well. You know, mm -hmm. you saw um, the child, you know, closest to us on, on our right, handing the other child um, a block. Um, and then I think you also saw or heard, I don't know if we saw it, that the teacher or that this um, occupational therapist had connected with the teacher and that they had sort of a plan moving forward, right? For some coaching, mm -hmm. how it mm -hmm. could be worked in throughout. Um, so, mm -hmm. so I thought there was some really nice, um, or at least hearing about some transdisciplinary perhaps teaming going mm -hmm. on or collaborative teaming. Mm -hmm. Did others see other um, practices within the video? Yeah, I think it was a little quick, but, you know, on the left side of the screen at the beginning of the video, you would see some visual cues. Um, I know in the longer video um, from Connect Modules, we do have um, the teacher showing the child to so that he can make a choice of um, what he wanted to do. And then they kind of moved into this um, building block activity. Thanks, Ching. Um, and I agree. I see in the chat that we have um, Christine. Um, I agree. I, that was one of the things I think we didn't talk about is that they had really talked about the child's IEP goals and his interests and how that could be included in the intervention. Um, and I agree, uh, Peggy. I do think there was more that could have been done to involve the other children. Um, mm -hmm. I will say I don't know what, you know, we, I don't have context for um, if this was, I think it sounds like this might be the first time this was introduced and hopefully yeah. as we mm -hmm. move forward and after some of that modeling has been done, um, the, the teacher, it will be more um, child to child. I really appreciate that point, Peggy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, you know, there's another um, part of the video that was kind of clipped away, but I think it's in a longer um, longer one that we have um, is that you see that um, at the end, the OT asked the uh, um, child, like, okay, um, you know, let's say we want to build a garage, you know, what, what is it that we need to build a garage? And then um, I think one of the boys actually helped to find a block and, and then gave it to the child. So it was a bit more collaborative that way. Yeah, but, um, but yeah, I mean, that's a definitely good um, comment about how other kids can be involved here. Yeah. All right. And I think, I think it is also important as we talk about this too, to think about, um, you know, that we see a snippet, but I love that folks are really thinking about um, within your own practice or others, how we can extend mm -hmm. um, and really make inclusion all day, every day. Um, and I do hope that if you have questions, you'll still continue to put them into the chat um, as well. Um, we can see that and we, we love hearing from you um, and we've appreciated your um, connection throughout too. And, yeah. oh, go ahead, Ching. <laughs> I know the answer. I don't know the answer. Yep. So I think, you know, like um, as what we've um, said throughout this um, presentation is that it is not zero-sum games um, and attitudes and beliefs really continue to be the biggest barrier for us in inclusion. 
And we heard it from our panel of STEM professionals on Tuesday, um, how people see them for their disability first rather than what they can do. But um, it is, you know, you people in the room, your families, mentors, um, teachers who um, are the early childhood pro um, practitioners who set those high expectations and provided the uh, opportunities for them to be included and to be successful. And Ching, I thought you were going to answer. There's a question in the chat um, where someone asked about were there more maps that other children could access um, within the connect within that video that we saw. Yeah, I'm not sure about that. I mean, but that could definitely be a good way to engage other children to um, collaborate together. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And yeah. And Patricia, I do like where you're going with that too, right? Um, I think what we were, and I, we didn't say this, but I know, Ching, what we were trying to convey too is that a lot of these things we're talking about are good practice, right? And they're supportive of all children. And so I think it's really important that, like you said, other children might benefit from the map as a starting point um, to then sort of you know, extend some of that learning too. And so I think that's a really important piece that you're saying, um, Patricia, is how do we ensure that we're individualizing for all of the children and families that we serve as well? And keep those questions coming. We do, um, we want to get to the final word cloud, but I also did want to really quickly say too, again, we wanted to just showcase that it isn't just um, for practitioners to do that we all need to think about, right? What can we do at a state level to facilitate inclusion? What do communities need to do? A lot of that collaboration is at the community level. Mm -hmm. um, and facilitating, you know, making sure that we're thinking about funding and professional development and all of those other things. Um, and what needs to happen at a local program, right? Like, is there time for practitioners to team and, um, engage in professional development? And then what happens with children and families? So ultimately, like Ching said, we can get to the fact that inclusion is a value add, right? It is, it is, good, um, it is good for all children. And there's research um, to support that as well, um, as it being really important that we stop excluding children um, from these experiences. Mm -hmm. Right. Ching, are we... Um, we, we also want you to think really quickly. Um, we want to get to the word cloud, but I do want you to be thinking when we get to the word cloud about what is an action step that you can take now to promote inclusive STEM opportunities for young children with disabilities in whatever role that is, right? So thinking <laughs> through what might be something you can do, we'd love for you to type it in the chat um, because we do think it's really important that we think about next actionable steps as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think, you know, as we were kind of like talking at the beginning and finding out what kinds of roles that you play, um, I think, you know, oftentimes there is just so much that we put on the slender shoulders of practitioners. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's really important for all of us in this room to just think about, like, how can we support um, early childhood practitioners? Um, if you are pre-service or in-service faculty, how are you embedding inclusion, teaching practices and STEM pedagogy into your coursework? And for those of us who are TA or PD providers, you know, what might be some of those job embedded professional development and coaching that you're doing around inclusion and in STEM? And really, I think, you know, we are not in this um, all by ourselves. I think, you know, we can see here at STEMIFest, there are so many resources and allies in your community. And in our midst, you know, museums, libraries, um, national technical assistance centers, and so much more. Thanks, Ching. And I think now might be the time to unveil. We know we have about a minute left, but we do want to show um, the um, word cloud that you all created, and we will make sure that we put it up. Um, as well. But I'm excited. It looks, yeah. And it looks like we see um, so some, okay, can, the connection was interrupted, but we see a lot, right? We see um, that folks are thinking about everyone benefits, that there are opportunities. Um, STEM is a big one. I love that, right? That's what mm -hmm. we're here for, inclusive STEM. 
focusing on strength space. Oh, I love that. Um, and I love that someone put environment materials and instruction, um, <laughs> right? Because I think if we can hit nothing else home, it's that we as the adults mm-hmm. need to think about what we can do to change, to engage all learners. Um, right. So we are really pleased. And Ching, what jumps out to you in the last minute? And then we Yeah, will... definitely opportunities and reflection. I think reflection is so important in our practice. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And thanks, Patricia, so much. We really appreciate your outreach work or you're talking about outreach work with community centers to think about how you know folks can provide some ideas um, based on some materials that they might have. And again, we can't thank you enough for coming with us to this. Um, We want to say thanks again. If you have more questions, feel free to reach out to Ching and I. Um, And we want to send you over to learn more about um, the STEMI and an accessible educational app that Dr. Wendy Sapp is going to talk about. Thanks so much. Yeah, thank you.